the Speaker, I can tell you that both initiatives will deliver more than what that last government attempted to when, for instance, they put out a $1 billion infrastructure scheme. Uh, tēnā koutou, I'm Selwyn Manning and welcome to A View From Afar. And today we are joined by political scientist Paul Buchanan and we will analyse the crisis, the tragedy that is unfolding in Afghanistan, including an apparent intelligence failure. Unanswered questions that we will consider today include why were United States intelligence unable to predict how poised and ready the Taliban were, or indeed were they unable? How did the Taliban prepare to take every province, every city in Afghanistan and keep their readiness a secret, supposedly, while they waited for the final phase of the US-led withdrawal to begin? And what should we make of the Taliban leadership? Should we be reassured or concerned at the Taliban's words of transition and also events that have taken place over the last 24 hours? And has the United States President Joe Biden damaged his reputation beyond repair in justifying the method of the United States' withdrawal in a speech that many, maybe accurately here, laced with a, suggest was laced with a cold indifference toward the human carnage that unfolded earlier this week around Kabul airport. So let's cross to Paul Buchanan, who is waiting online to discuss these issues. Good afternoon, Paul. Tanakwe, Matua. Uh, Tanakwe, Selwyn, and uh, glad to be here. I hope you're enjoying your lockdown. It's not too bad here. It's, uh, certainly, uh, you know, it takes a bit of de deja vu going back to um, last year in 2020 when New Zealand experienced its first level four lockdown. And of course, um, we've got Delta um, variant that's uh, going around New Zealand at the moment. So, yeah, Paul's absolutely right. We're all in level four lockdown, confined to our homes in an enforceable situation so there we go <laughs> hopefully we beat it hey paul yeah we will okay so the benefit of these technologies is that evolved out of the uh the, the, this this pandemic so that we can do our job like we're doing right now so car pie to yeah. that paul um so yeah. paul let, let's have a look at um and if you can take us through and unpack the situation that is unfolding in afghanistan um the things we're going to talk about today clearly are looking at whether or not there was an intelligence failure or was there a situation where the intelligence community did brief the elected leaders, um, Trump, for example, and also uh, the, the current president, um, Joe Biden, of exactly this consequence, um, should they deploy a withdrawal at such a speed, at such speed, etc. We'll also look at um, um, the humanitarian impact. We'll look at, um, as said in the introduction, Paul, um, with respect to whether or not the Taliban are different this time round or whether or not um, it's mm. just a matter of time before they regret back. But in, in, in the first instance, Paul, how do you read it right now? Uh, well, obviously not. This is uh, a very delicate situation. And we'll, we'll turn to the Taliban in a second, because this is, this is not your father's Taliban. This is Taliban 2.0. And they're different from the regime that ruled in the 90s. But I'll leave that aside for the time being. Uh, you, you mentioned intelligence failure, and there's several ways to look at it. I happen to think that it might be a combination uh, of all the things I'm about to mention, but I think the baseline should be what the intelligence reports were when, uh, when Trump assumed the office of the presidency. So mid-2016, what was the intelligence on the Taliban and the prospects of a U.S. troop withdrawal? Because remember, the U.S. was already drawing down uh, from Afghanistan at that time. And uh, I'd start that as a baseline, because here are the scenarios. Uh, one could be that the intelligence from the field, so that, let's say, the CIA guys out in the rural countryside in Afghanistan were incompetent, and uh, they were too afraid to leave their outposts. They didn't get into the villages. They might not speak the language. Uh, there's something called the Human Terrain Mapping Project which was a joint CIA-US military 
operation where they bring anthropologists who could speak Pashtun, speak some of the regional dialects, and try to get tactical intelligence uh, for the fighting forces. That was disbanded because a couple of those civilian anthropologists were killed. And the American Anthropological Association, uh, when that happened, lost their minds and uh, basically demanded that the military stop using civilian anthropologists for these projects. Well, uh, if that didn't continue, it is possible that the reports from the field were faulty and were just embellished in order to make these guys look good. Now, I happen to think that uh, that might be the case in some circumstances, uh, but it might not have. There could have been good CIA people on the ground saying, look, at the Taliban are doing what the Viet Cong do, what every good guerrilla movement does, which is they've receded into the human terrain. They've gone into the villages. They've uh, hidden their weapons, and they're just biding their time. In well, fact, let's, the Taliban just on that, because it would be good to do this um, in, in, in sections because it's um, so complex. To support your premise there, let's just have a look at this document here. And uh, this has been published on uh, Just Security. Um, and thank you for the link to this uh, for, from William Thorpe, who follows us on, on uh, LinkedIn and has his own podcast in this kind of space as well. Now, um, what we've got here, for example, is Dun Douglas L um, London, who has got a distinguished career going back 30-something years, 36 years, I think it is, um, and who is now retired from CIA involvement. But he was the CIA regional chief for, for the, the region that included Afghanistan up until um, uh, uh, nine, uh, 2019, Paul. He is saying a similar thing to you. He is basically saying that the, the CIA actually put together... Um, a recommendation that a complete withdrawal uh, off the table in the sense that the CIA had a, would have a large contingent remaining in different areas of, of Afghanistan, but particularly around the significant cities, including obviously Kabul. Uh, he, he is saying here in his piece here um, uh, that, that uh, in just security that the presidents, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, uh, and Joe Biden significantly from the point of view during the campaign um, uh, toward becoming president, w were well and truly briefed on the failures that would be likely um, on a scale of probable probabilities, you know, certainly waiting into the reality areas should the United States withdraw at, at, at pace. Um, he goes in some, in, into some detail with respect to the way others... Um, advisories had had positioned themselves for their own benefit under Donald Trump and certainly you know under Biden as well but uh, I just wanted to bring that up at, right at this moment Paul just to say and and to support that premise that you're saying there's don't take the intelligence failures at face value there's intelligence failures absolutely but there is another level of concern that's underneath that which may be uh, problematic for for Joe Biden perhaps is that correct yeah, I think that the, the the way to think about it is that these field <clears throat> these field officers they report to not just the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. You know, the way for a CIA officer to get information up the chain of command is they more often than not have to go through embassies, and the embassy is not just the one in Kabul. If they're in eastern Afghanistan, they might want to choose the embassy in Islamabad. Uh, you know, they can they can go outside of the country to d deliver their reports, which are then sent to Langley. Uh, there's where things get interesting. Uh, either they could try to embellish the reports on the way to the embassy to make themselves look good. But most field officers, I mean, by virtue of the fact that they're in that particular field, uh, tend to be honest in their reporting. The embassy CIA station chief may want to make things look a little rosier than they are and so they might play a little bit a tone it down if you will in terms of the negativity and then there's the politicization of the upper echelons of the u.s national security apparatus uh, not just the cia leadership which i tend to think have a little more integrity but if you think of the national security council particularly those who were there uh during the trump administration uh it's possible 
that they downplayed the, the costs of a hasty withdrawal and overplayed uh, the strength of the Afghan National Army uh, and that sort of thing. And there's but also um, good support for a withdrawal back in the United States. So both candidates in the previous presidential election had a lot of currency on this particular issue, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, okay. Let, and let, let's establish that as the bottom line. Leaving Afghanistan was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, a 20 year, as they call them, forever war with no resolution in sight, with a steadfastly determined enemy who is indigenous to the country. The top, mm. That's their country. It's not mm. NATO's yeah. country. And, 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 and this is co comparisons to, uh, to, to, to Vietnam come, come in, don't they? Absolutely. On, on this. Absolutely. Forget the helicopter coming off the embassy roof. The fact is, is the Taliban did what good guerrilla movements do, they receded into the population. They got out of the way of the superior force. They conducted hit and run ambush missions. They used IEDs, but they didn't confront the ISAF forces force on force. Remember, the Taliban didn't have a Navy. The Taliban don't have an Air Force. The Taliban are basically an infantry movement with relatively light weapons. And they defeated the Afghan National Army which had 350,000 troops. The total number of Taliban are about 75,000. Many of them are teenagers, 13-year-old, 14-year-old boys. And that's, that's the important thing. These guys fought. I mean, they've been annihilated. Hundreds of thousands of Taliban have been killed since 2001. And they keep on coming back from war. Mm. And they do not quit. Now, and so, you know, one, we, may not some like, of the we may not like their ideology, but we yeah. have to respect their, their will, their determination to prevail. And that will was absent from the Afghan National Army, not amongst the troops per se, but amongst the corrupt officers. who They were the ones who fled first. And if you're a 20-year-old soldier and you see your commanding officers jumping in a Mercedes-Benz and fleeing to try to get to Kabul International Airport, then what's, your, yeah. what's the point of fighting? You know, so, one of the things that, um, you know, come, come through, comes through very strongly here is uh, keeps coming back to me. You know, there's, there's the documentary, The Fog of War, you know, where Robert mm -hmm. McNamara is integrity, pretty much a one-on-one a -on -one with Errol Morris, the, uh, the director and creator of that documentary. One of the things they're going through is what was learnt from the Vietnam War. And, and McNamara, I'm paraphrasing here, of, of course, but he, he kind of alludes to the fact that they didn't understand the enemy. They thought that they, meaning the United States and the Allies, thought they were fighting an ideological war and they were, everything was in that frame. But when they realised at the end of it we'd made a major mistake that our enemy, the Viet Cong, were a nationalistic uh, army. They wanted their country back from colonial rule. It had been French, it had been in the United States, all these others getting, getting a slice of the pie. Um, and that's something that comes back here, doesn't it, Paul? You know, from the point of view of Afghanistan as mineral rich, this is something that a regular watcher and part of our audience, Kevin Hester, uh, put on Facebook. And he says, could you guys discuss this if you can? What, and what, 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 you know, <laughs> What attraction is there within Afghanistan from the point of view of imperial forces or United States forces, Western forces, and then what we're seeing now, China forces, which you alluded to in a couple of episodes, a few episodes back, um, et cetera, et cetera, Russia, all wanting a slice of Afghanistan. We understand there's gold, there's copper, there's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all of these kind of things happening. But, Paul, getting back to the comparisons of history, it seems like the Taliban... Some are saying have learnt from their own mistakes in the last 20 years, have the West, and if not, what can be done about this? Because there's fear and loathing, obviously, in controlling the population that is going on in Afghanistan right as we speak from a humanitarian point of view. Well, the fundamental lesson to be learned is that once they originally defeated the Taliban, much the way they defeated Saddam Hussein's forces in Iraq, the foreign occupiers, not just the United States, but the coalitions that were that surrounded them, should have pulled out and left. The beginning of the end started with the nation building premise. And that's what I would call the imperial hubris. 
you are going to take a pre-modern society. You know, Afghanistan has that well-known urban-rural divide. The urban areas are relatively modernized. The rural areas are pre-modern in orientation. And the arrogance in this hubris was that the West thought that they could build a nation in a country that doesn't have a nation. There are 20 ethnicities in Afghanistan. There are not only two, two uh, subsects of Islam, there's Shia and Sunni Muslim. Uh, there are Buddhists. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's not a unified, coherent whole. And so you could create a country using the borders drawn up by the British a century or so ago, but you can't create a nation out of that, all those moving parts. And that was the era, is that they defeated the Taliban and removed Afghanistan as a safe haven for al-Qaeda, because that's how that all started. Mm -hmm. uh, and had they limited themselves to that, it's very possible that there would have been a brutal civil war to sort out the post-Taliban government. It more than likely would have emerged as some sort of federal system run by warlords, but at least it would be Afghan, Afghani. Uh, the governments that have been created, besides being kleptocratic, you know, insanity at its highest, uh, the very fact that they were Western-backed discredited them, delegitimized them outside of the main urban centers. You know, and so add to that their, their grotesque corruption, and you've got the makings of a slow-moving disaster, which is exactly what happened. And mind you, uh, it was replicated to some extent in Iraq as well. I mean, the fact is, is that Daesh, ISIS, uh, was created out of the Sunni resistance to the U.S. occupation. Mm -hmm. So both places, and they're in Iraq plays a hand, because the U.S. diverted resources from Afghanistan to fight the unnecessary war in Iraq. You know, it was a war of opportunity. Saddam had nothing to do with 9-11. So the mistakes were multiple. They were compounded, uh, uh, aided and abetted by NATO, countries like Australia and New Zealand that joined that coalition without asking serious questions about what nation building meant. Um, again, Two, two things come to mind. The first one is from an American officer. You know, I trained intelligence officers, both uniformed and civilian, back in the day. And one of them, one of the military guys who's now more senior, uh, said, uh, said in, a, in a group conversation that the thing about the nation building was that these people, he was referring to just villagers and whatnot, uh, would smile and shake your hand during the day and then they would sneak back at night and kill you. That they accepted your, the, the accoutrements of modernization. They liked the, you know, the, the health clinics, they liked the modern sewage systems, but they were not absorbing Western values. They totally categorically rejected the idea of, let's say, equality for women, uh, mm -hmm. democracy as the way of choosing leaders. I mean, this ran antithetical to their traditional ways of living, not just leadership selection, you know, this and is a country run, run by warlords. You know, so, uh, uh, you've you've written about this on Kiwi Politico. We brought it up just before, and um, I'd strongly suggest people come and have a read of this. It's kiwipolitico.com, and Paul is, uh, has, has written a, an evaluative piece here, extremely detailed and thorough, and, you know, salute to you for that, Paul. But you, you, oh, you, 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 you have... Um, highlighted in the, this part that this is exactly what you're talking about here, isn't it? From the point of view of, um, you know, forcing a democracy on a country of which is recent history, if not, you know, the long standing history is, is they're not there yet. That, that these, and that doesn't excuse in any way human rights abuses, of course, but in some ways, too, Joe Biden's speech that um, has been widely criticised, and in my view, rightfully so, um, he, he makes reference to this as well, doesn't he, from the point of view of uh, we, he meaning the United States, went in there with its coalition of the willing to, or coalition forces, I should say, to actually uh, hunt out and rid the country of, of terrorist groups, 
Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then it crept on to enforcing and restructuring a capacity building or supporting kind of uh, uh, um, infrastructure on a democratic ground, etc. And look, Paul, if you can take us through just this element, um, you know, for, of what you've written here, that would be better than me trying to paraphrase it for sure. Well, well, let's. <clears throat> I, I urge the listeners if they've got time to spare. Uh, to go read the uh, the essay, it's a bit long, but I try to cover a lot of ground. And and, and for this segment, Selwyn, so, I'll limit myself to sort of just saying why Afghanistan turned out to be the disaster that it has become, and that simply there were a lot of mistakes made, a lot of assumptions made about what foreign intervention could do in Afghanistan, and it was those faulty assumptions that have led us to where we are today. The assumptions that you could build a democracy where there never has been one, the assumption that you could operate uh, anti-corruption campaigns when black markets and corruption are a way of life in that particular part of the world, uh, all those assumptions proved false. And I will say that uh, you know Biden was handed a bad, bad deck of cards uh, by his predecessor, but let's not pile on your average Afghan National Army soldier or policeman. They served what they thought was their nation's cause alongside the foreign troops, thinking they could help make it a better place, if not just for a paycheck. They fought, by and large, pretty well. But two things happened. Their officers were corrupt, and let them down and fled. It reminds me of the Argentine officers in the Falklands Malvinas War, where the Argentine officers commandeered airplanes and got off the islands, leaving their young troops in the field to face a professional army. Uh, those troops in the field were conscripts, and many of the Afghan troops are conscripts. Uh, they did that. The other thing, and again, it came from a U.S. military guy, he said, look at we created the Afghan National Army as a mini-me of the U.S. Army. And so they became very dependent on air cover. They, you know, they, they'd fight, but they really were looking for air cover. And when the Americans withdrew, that air cover went away. Oh, that uh, the Afghan air, okay. Yeah, the Afghan Air yeah. Force is small. I mean, there is an Air Force, but they no longer had the security of close air support when they, uh, they engaged in combat with Taliban units who, again, were using the element of surprise, were using the element of local knowledge to their advantage. And so by creating a mini-me army uh, in what was essentially a protracted guerrilla war, they set the Afghan army up for failure. So I don't think we can bash them as much as I see in Western media. It was the officers and the faulty organizational principles that led that army to collapse once it was confronted full on by the Taliban forces who merely literally came out of the ground. So as, 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 as history often shows us, the commanders at the top or uh, World War II showed it in, in, in stark uh, reality there that uh, when there's nothing else and there's no, no, no chance of actually digging in and, and surviving, Surrender is often the only thing that's available to a person. Look, but oh, one last thing. One, just you know, yeah. the, the the I subscribe to the old-fashioned theory of warfare, which is uh, what d decides wars, what decides conflicts, is the element of will, the determination to keep on fighting. And what's interesting is it's not the side that suffers suffers the least amount of losses that prevails, it's the side that can continue to take losses and keep on fighting. Mm. And the Taliban definitely were doing that. And a Taliban commander uh, said a, a remarkable thing just about 18 months ago, as they resurrected, he said, oh, the Americans have technology, they have equipment, but we have time. Yeah, time. And I think, and I yeah. think that's it. If you're fighting a superior force, you use guerrilla tactics, but you use time to your advantage. The foreigners don't have the will to stay there forever. 
the domestic public back at home starts wondering of what what are they doing there's no victory in sight mm -hmm. and that undermines the will of the superior fighting force and more importantly it undermines the will of the politicians who ordered them to go there in the first place that's it it's over yeah. the it's weaker over. guys are going to win so this was visible 18 months ago at a minimum and i would get back to our original point i bet you the intelligence guys were saying this to langley and Langley was saying it to the White House, and let's just say for a variety of reasons, neither Trump or Biden wanted to uh, say in public what I think, well, what is now evident, which is that as soon as we leave in numbers, the Taliban will be back and as strong, if not stronger than before, and uh, their advance on Kabul will be, uh, will be very quick. I think this and, is all and hindsight, but I think wiser yeah. heads may have well warned them and they simply yeah. couldn't bring themselves to talk about it in public and which which president was it paul that said the buck stops here oh harry truman there you go i'm um, like yeah, biden, uh, biden, I, biden biden rephrased that but um anyway mm. it, he, he borrowed someone else's phrase that was probably not the wisest thing to do uh but you know it's the situation he was handed and uh and now we got to live with it. Yeah. So then in, in many parts explains the situation where we are. And of course, there's chaos. And you can see that even from the point of view of pulling information in, there's a, there's a sense of that, uh, that, that, that unease about where things are running on a, on a minute and hourly basis up in Afghanistan. Um, let's just see what the main, uh, main news organisations in the United States, how they've been reporting it overnight, and uh, then we'll, we'll come back into um, looking at what is the consequence for the people in Afghanistan and also what are the consequences for the political uh, people, the, the President of the United States' administration from a credibility point of view back in the United States. So we're, what we pick up here is, uh, we'll pick up ABC is probably a good the way, Kabul one airport to uh, where US illustrate troops are here. scrambling to fly Americans and allies out of the country. At least 3,200 diplomats and civilians have been evacuated from Afghanistan on military flights so far. But anyone trying to get to the airport has to pass through Taliban checkpoints and not everyone's getting through. Meanwhile, the Taliban is promising a general amnesty for all U.S. allies in Afghanistan. One senior leader saying now is the time to forgive and that they are not seeking revenge. But the U.S., the EU, and at least 19 other countries now say in a joint statement they are, quote, deeply worried about Afghan women and girls and their rights and freedoms. Our senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. Is so, Paul, you know, that, that's hit on um, some of the obvious um, big issues here um, from the point of view of what's happening in Afghanistan and one of the things that stands out to me is that the Taliban obviously have the Kabul airport in control. There are reports coming out of the United States that just with respect to the United States' interests, there are thousands of United States citizens and um, that are, remain in different parts of Afghanistan. And uh, then on top of that, there are those that have been assisting the United States-led forces uh, for some time and are at great risk. So those that are going are uh, 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 transiting to um, Kabul airport to attempt to get out on United States uh, Air Force planes are obviously having to go through checks um, that the Taliban have put there. What do you make of that? And then um, from the point of view, we'll, after that, Paul, we'll, we'll head and we'll look at um, Biden's handling of this whole affair. Okay, let me, <clears throat> let me uh, cast this in a, in a broader perspective. The Taliban are not a monolithic organization, monolithic movement. They have a political wing that is mostly overseas, uh, based in Doha, and they have a military wing, which are the people on the ground who have now taken control of Kabul. Uh, they control the country. They control all border crossings. The people on the ground are more militant and fundamentalist in their views than are the political wing in Doha. But the political wing is doing the negotiating. Uh, they assume that they will become the leaders of the new Taliban government. That is an assumption that has yet to be proven. The hard fact is, is the political leadership will have to gain control of the military leadership on the ground in order to keep any promises that are being made. 
because again, the fighters are militant. And I would say it to you this way. Imagine, for example, that you're a 19-year-old Taliban and your father was killed off in the first round when the U.S. showed up in 2001. But five or six years ago, a drone strike took out your entire family clan because it was looking for one guy at a wedding party next door. You're probably not well disposed to show mercy to foreigners. You know, you're probably, you know, pretty angry about what has become uh, of, of your life thanks to these foreign occupiers. So the key now is for the political leadership to show that it can control its militant military wing. They've got to have that command and control structure. You know who does? Hezbollah, Hamas. Their political leaderships, which are also in Doha, interestingly, they have better control over their militant wings because many of the political leaders are former military commanders who left because the Israelis were getting too close to them. The Taliban in Doha have to go home. They have to exert their moderating influence on the militants in order to cut any deal, not just about the treatment of the Afghan people under their rule, but the treatment of foreigners trying to get out of Afghanistan over the next 30 days. I mean, it is possible that they may negotiate a land corridor safe haven between Kabul and the border in Pakistan, because the volume of people that are trying to get out is such that it's going to be very hard to do so uh, using airplanes alone. And so it's that political wing that has to show up now, exert its authority over the military wing, and then broker something that uh, not only will be durable, but will be binding on that military wing. And let's be honest, the military wing itself is tribalized, it's factionalized. I mean, a lot of ruthless stuff is happening in the rural countryside. I mean, vicious. Yeah, well, look, let's look at that right now. Yeah. Al Jazeera reported um, earlier this uh, morning, New Zealand time. The Taliban reassured the world people will be safe under its rule. Its fighters have reportedly opened fire on protesters. Our reports, three people were killed at the demonstration against the group's takeover of the eastern city of Jalalabad. People were marching in the streets, chanting and carrying the Afghan flag. Video of the event later showed Taliban fighters firing into the air and hitting protesters with sticks. So things to, as, as is expected, you know, there are many people obviously in the country that are saying they don't want the Taliban, they don't trust them, there's this, there's that. Taliban's obviously, uh, Taliban fighters there obviously asserting the, their, their own presence in such a such a way. Um, Paul, is this an, an example of what you were talking about there where the, the, the political wing of the Taliban needs to come back? They need to actually assert their authority in some ways, if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying correctly here, correct me if I'm not, um, on, on the people on the ground. Do we see the opportunity for the Taliban to tidy ship in such ways, or should we be hugely skeptical, skeptical, and and deeply concerned um, for the well-being of all of those people, women in particular, children um, that have had twenty years, in some respects, um, to get a sense of of opportunity, um, and, and then potentially could be rolled away out from underneath them right now. Well, that's just it, and that that there are some some optimistic signs. Uh, and you mentioned it. Remember what I said earlier. This is Taliban 2.0. This is not the original Taliban, and for several reasons. Again, their entire cadres, fighting and political, uh, have emerged in the last 20 years. There's very few old Taliban around because they're not alive. I mean, they've been killed off. Uh, more importantly, though, Afghan society, at least in the cities, okay, the major cities, uh, uh, has changed. It turns out that the average age of an Afghan is 18.5 years, which means that the majority of Afghans were born after the Taliban were overthrown in 2002. 30% of the public workforce are women. 
something it, the, that percentage was zero in 2002. Uh, they have civil rights, uh, universal rights, and what have you, and they're young, so it'll be difficult to convince without force these people to give up their so-called freedoms, much less their jobs and that sort of thing. And here is an interesting point. For the Taliban to rule, they need engineers. They need, uh, you know, they need architects. They need public bureaucrats. They need diplomats. You need a, a degree of sophistication and education to be a diplomat. The would they be, ex would uh, they be ex accepted by the West in such ways, um, in the same way that the people in Doha have been engaged with by Western diplomats, etc.? Well, the, 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 the political leadership, um, several of them are foreign educated. My point is, is that the Taliban are inheriting a society that is not medieval in the cities. You know, this, these are modernized. They may not be like New York City, but they're modernized societies. And for them to prosper, they need, they need those 30% of women, many of whom are engineers, are architects, uh, you know, accountants, lawyers, uh, all these sort of things are now in place. So trying to return to the dark ages is going to require an amount of repression that would have to equal Pol Pot in terms of... Well, see, of this, this is exactly... going there. This is, Yeah, this is exactly the point, though, isn't it? That do leopards change their spots? Do people that have been treated in such ways and have resisted over all of these years get to a point where they want to engage with the West or do they isolate themselves off once again? All of us, Paul, we remember, obviously, um, the situation that existed in Afghanistan all of those years ago where beheadings in public, for example, where women, you know, if they were a victim of some sexual violence, were seen to be the perpetrators of such things. And I know that in some ways around the world, um, Afghanistan or the Taliban rule all those years ago was not unique in that, that kind of area. But these are the things that haunt many today, and particularly there is a, a widespread view, I think, within the Western nations and the populations that these are the reasons of justification of why our forces were there and enduring all of the, this time. So to abandon that view is, is a tall ask. And it seems to me too that the question around whether or not the Taliban are going to be, they have changed or they're going to change, there, there's a sense in seeing, uh, in this uh, kind of evaluation that comes out of obviously Joe Biden's camp, but also here in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern made reference to it too. We hear their words, let's see what their actions are. Is it a wait and see situation as these leaders have actually identified here? Uh, yeah, it is. Let's be very clear. The Taliban are going to rule as authoritarians. They're not Democrats. But, you know, you were mention you're mentioning beheadings and people wearing burqas. Sounds like Saudi Arabia to me. Sounds like Iran yeah. to me. That's what yeah, I was talking it, about from the point of view of not being unique. Um, and obviously uh, there's a degree of hypocrisy where we accept and engage with um, countries like Saudi from from that point of view. Exactly. But are, here's, but are we, does that justify it in, inside of Afghanistan um, under Taliban rule? Yeah, but here, here's, here's the big difference. There are now economic interests in the mineral riches of Afghanistan that were not in place in the 1990s. Uh, China, Russia... India, and of course, Pakistan, all have their eyes on the prize, the Chinese in particular. They want to invest as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Afghanistan is strategically located as the crossroads of South Central Asia. Uh, it's a prize. The Taliban know that. Uh, they may remove the Westerners, but they may welcome the Chinese. Now, I'm told that uh, Pashtuns in particular are not big fans of the Chinese, but they are fans of Chinese money. And so just like Saudi Arabia is allowed to behave the way it does, to a lesser extent, just the way the theocrats in Iran are allowed to behave the way they do. If economic interests are present and are willing to play ball with the Taliban, 
two things will happen. The Taliban will have to moderate a little bit in order to keep that investment flowing, and the foreign interlocutors will have to show them support in order to mitigate against the more militant uh, aspects of their rule. Let's face it, militancy is bad for business. And moderation is good for business. So the role of external actors is going to be very important, not so much in propping up the regime, but if you will, in framing the way it goes about approaching uh, its, its rule, its, gov its, its governance. And I think there, we may have to admit the fact that uh, the West needs to butt out. That so the, the, West, the opportunity the, for the future in, in stabilizing Afghanistan remains with the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians, no one else. Yeah the, Ru yeah, the Russians, of course, have a geopolitical interest. They just want to create good buffers. But they, they have investors ready to go in. They know the country. The Indians want to use Afghanistan as a strategic buffer, not only against the Pakistanis, but against the Chinese. The Chinese, of course, are all about the economic wealth of the country. And so uh, it's very possible that these countries will cast a blind eye on the authoritarianism in exchange for economic uh, benefit. Would they cast would, a blind eye, eye, for example, reports, you know, obviously coming out in the provinces where, where the, the around the question of where does the Taliban finance its efforts over the last, say, 10 years, for example. And that, there's a myriad of uh, answers to that in many, many different ways. One of the things through narcotics, another thing is obviously with the Chinese mineral exploration and exploitation there, there are allegations of extortion um, that, that are going on with the private Chinese companies or private Chinese companies that are inside Afghanistan on such things. So, so Taliban sound like if those reports are accurate, have got a tidy ship in those ways too, wouldn't they? One would expect. Absolutely. You want, you want to centralize that, and you make a really good point. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the Taliban financed themselves. Well, of course, mm. they got help from some anti-Western powers. China, the Russians supplied them with weapons, Pakistan. Of course, we know this. But, you know, there's a little-known fact about uh, the, the Afghan economy. It's not all about opium and hashish. The fact is, is that the Taliban controlled the supply routes crossing Afghanistan, north to south, east to west, not just of black market goods like drugs, but everyday goods like petrol, like uh, dry food. They taxed everybody moving on the roads when the ISAF forces weren't there. They'd pop up and they do revenue collection at the border, in the center of Afghanistan, and on the way out the other side. And so they find that that illegal economy or illegal revenue stream dwarfed the drug trade. I mean, mm. they taxed everything that moved and they just got out of the way when the Americans sent patrols down a highway. But as soon as they left, boom, the revenue gathering stations were back and every truck that was moving goods had to pay a tax, whether or not it was the goods were going to stay in Afghanistan. So uh, they know how to collect revenue. They know how to cut deals with suppliers. What they need to do is stop all the rogue operators and the factional, the different factions in the countryside, centralize that revenue control, and, uh, and then use that money for public projects. That remains to be seen, but that is quite feasible. Uh, you know, but that goes back to, you know, they need an educated workforce to negotiate mineral deals with the Chinese. I mean, you know, you can't have a bunch of rubes sitting around letting the Chinese dictate the terms. Mm. And I got a feeling that uh, at least some elements of the political leadership are not only well aware of all of this, but they are not rubes. So mm. they know they need to gain control of their people, centralize the operation so that all revenue collection goes to the central government. And I have a feeling that they're going to realize very quickly that they have to return to some sort of, if not federation, some sort of semi-autonomous governance in the various provinces, particularly though where ethnic minorities are the majority, like Bamiyan. You know, the Hazaras, yep. uh, let's just say they've suffered a lot at the hands of Pashtun, but they're still around. 
Uh, and I don't think that they're going to take kindly to very deep repressive rules. So it would be wise for the Taliban in Kabul to give them some degree of autonomy in exchange uh, for loyalty to the central government. That I think all of that is on the table. So okay. I am not as I'm not as fearful mm. as many in the West. And let's be honest, a lot of the discourse in the United States and the UK in particular is very partisan. There's all this blame game going on and who lost Afghanistan. Yep. There's midterm elections in the United States next year. You know the Republicans are going to use this. Yeah, as I a want to pick that to up. Hammer Joe Biden. Yep. Yeah. And yep. so, so let, but also in the UK. Let's pick this up. So back, back um, on, on this very point, Paul, um, I just wanted to um, pick up on what is happening inside the United States, for example, with respect to Joe Biden's um, uh, leadership and whether or not there are successful, whether, whether, put it this way, whether or not the Republicans are successful in picking up this opportunity here, political opportunity I'm talking about. There's a sense that the, um, for example, that the speech that Joe Biden did earlier this week with respect to the withdrawal um, did not satisfy the expectations of many in the United States. The newspaper, the, the, uh, the, the cable networks, news networks are, are full of this. Here, for example, what we've got on screen at the moment is a statement that's coming out of, and this is representative of many Republicans in the House of Representatives, um, and, and this is Congressman Darrell Isaac, for example, and what he's talking about is putting together, and he's he's created um, a series of questions that Joe Biden must answer. And it seems to me, from a political point of view, an opportunity for the first time has opened up where Joe Biden is really being tested from the point of view of the United States as population's own interests. And some of the questions, for example, are why did you fail to create or implement a coherent plan to evacuate all Americans from Afghanistan? Why were your intelligence assessments so incorrect? What did the United States agree to to give Taliban in exchange for the ability to extract Americans? What does our precipitous withdrawal signal to our allies, including Ukraine and Taiwan. Why should anyone trust the Biden administration again on issues of national security? Now, Paul, that's coming out of Republicans in the House of Representatives, and, it's, and those kind of questions are put in all so many different ways. The United States' media are being flooded with this type of thing, and the criticisms of Biden is getting traction. Is his reputation... Is it damaged irreparably, or do you see that all of this is noise and preparing for the, the, the midterm elections next year and the Republicans, Republicans simply have taken an opportunity and are using it well? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a short-term answer and a long-term answer. Uh, it's very clear that Biden mis, mis, misread the room. Uh, you know, his statement only added fuel to the fire. That's, that's undoubtable. Now, uh, Representative Issa needs to ask the same questions of Donald Trump, <clears throat> excuse me, because it was Donald Trump who put up the original timeline and released Taliban prisoners without the exchange of uh, Afghan government prisoners that was agreed to by the political leadership in, in Doha. It was Donald Trump who released a couple of the leaders who are now negotiating uh, in Doha, you know, from Guantanamo, of all things. So if he's honest, he'll ask the Trump administration officials, if not, <coughs> pardon me, Donald Trump himself, the exact same questions. But and I with, think with, with the thing that the, the buck does stop with Biden now, he's the one who's made the decisions to withdraw at the pace of withdrawal um, and, and potentially against uh, intelligence advice. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd have to see that. I mean, I think that I don't want, and I, I, I don't want to argue along partisan lines. You know, that's not no. our role here. No, but, it's not. You know, he, 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 he inherited a very bad deck uh, of cards laid to him by Donald Trump. Uh, you know, we can't get around that. Okay, we can't. Donald Trump hmm. negotiated the deal to withdraw all the remaining U.S. troops by the end of this year. But the incumbent uh, what, is um, uh, committed to coming up with solutions that meet, aren't they? 
and and Biden's solution set has been found very wanting. Mm. He should assume responsibility for the last 60 days and say, you know, you know, we discounted their ability to take ground. Uh, we discounted the sympathies that existed along the way to Kabul. We, you know, we un un overestimated the ability of the Ghani government to stay together uh, and its army to fight. We, you know, all those things are on my watch. So I'm Joe Biden. The buck will, uh, for those 60 days, will stop here. But I inherited this. And mm -hmm. let's face it, do the Americans want to continue, as he said, another decade of an endless war with no resolution in sight? I mean, that was the thing. Another thing that... Uh, a uh, 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 U.S. military uh, guy mentioned very, very tellingly. He said, look, if we fight in Afghanistan out of a sense of revenge. We wanted to get at the people who helped al-Qaeda attack us. And then because we're professionals, we go where we're told to go. He goes, these other guys, they fight for Allah. They have no time frame. You know, this is a, you know, this is, I won't say a crusader war, but they're fighting for Allah. And so it doesn't end. It never ends. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is an existential struggle to them. And he goes, we cannot win against such an adversary. Well, but, but, has, told the president. but has Biden been damaged irreparably from this or will he no. recover? No, this, that's the good news. That's the longer term thing. The good news, if there is any, and certainly not for a lot of Af Afghans, is that we're what we're in August now, so we're 14 months away from the November 2022 20, uh, elections. He's got a lot of time to recover from this misstep. By the time we roll around to November 22, this is going to be old news for the majority of Americans. And if he can divert their attention into his trillion dollar infrastructure project, if they can see tangible benefits in a democratic-led economy, then all of this is going to be water under the bridge. I mean, when you have people, leading commentators, saying openly, admittedly on American television, that American lives are more valuable than Afghan lives, and, you know, that it, it, people aren't made equal, we're more equal than others. If that is an attitude that is shared widely in the United States, and unfortunately it is, then all of this will be past history. And the question then becomes, will the U.S. reformulate its approach to foreign conflict in general, but certainly this nation building stuff, and most particularly this whole regime change and democratic, democratization nonsense, if they rethink that, then allies like Taiwan and the Ukraine don't have to worry. They're in different strategic situations anyway, so making those sort of comparisons uh, is it's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, but having said that, uh, they do have reason to think that the U.S. might cut and run on them. But let's face it, the U.S. stayed for 20 years in Afghanistan. That's not cutting and running. That was, in fact, a death by a thousand cuts uh, on the ISAF forces uh, you know, uh, committed by the Taliban and the futility of nation building in a country that doesn't have a United Nation to begin with. So uh, I think he's going to survive this. I think that he'll take a lot of heat uh, until all Americans and perhaps uh, I think they're, they've, they've allowed 30,000 special visas for Afghans who worked with the Americans. Uh, special visas, but already the Trump wing of the Republican Party are saying, no, no, no. No special visa. We don't want them. Send them some other place. Well, no, but they work for us. Oh, no, no, no. There could be jihadis amongst them. I mean, it's that sort of xenophobic, racist paranoia mm. that infects the Republican Party that's going to make it very difficult for the U.S. to honor its promises uh, to the people who supported them. But I think they will. I think eventually the U.S. will try to assimilate as many of it can. And we here in New Zealand owe it to the Afghans who helped us in Bamiyan and elsewhere to do exactly the same. Uh, but come next year, uh, all of this will be old news and the Republicans will move on to some other culture war aspect 
Uh, and if, again, as I said, if he's able to get that infrastructure project up and running, um, this will be all but, uh, be all but uh, forgotten. On that sobering political reality, Paul, thank you again for the, unpacking a lot of complexity today and all of the moving tangents that are uh, occurring right now, notwithstanding the, uh, the fact that many, obviously thousands and thousands of Afghanis are concerned for their own livelihoods as we speak and the uncertainty that comes with any kind of change. Um, until next week, thank you again, Paul, um, and to those who have joined us live, we appreciate that, and also those who are seeing it on demand. Um, we will be back with another big issue relating to security, intelligence and defence issues at this time next week. Thank you. Kia ora. Goodbye. <laughs>